I asked you guys on TikTok and Instagram what you wanted to see on this YouTube channel and a lot of you said you wanted an extended get to know me like from the start to where I am now. So I'm gonna do my best to tell you my life story. <laughs> Buckle up, grab a Beverageino, grab a snack, Linda. We're gonna be here for a minute because I got 32 years to recap for you. Let's start it from the top. I think to start from the top, we actually have to start from before I was born because that is relevant. My mom, Pat, and my dad, John, met in their teens in Southern California. My mom taught dance class and had a bunch of different like odds and ends jobs. And my dad was a musician. He was really talented, actually. He toured with Motown, which if you know anything about music, like that's actually really cool. <laughs> actually, my dad's drummer in his band is now Pink's drummer, which is really cool. He like still talks to my mom sometimes, which I think is awesome. Shout out to my mom though. She ultimatum to my dad because after a while of touring, my mom was like, I wanna settle down and have a family. And like, if you don't wanna do that, then that's fine. But then I'm gonna leave and I'm gonna go find somebody that wants that because that's what she wanted for her life. And so my dad said, yes, he stopped touring and he settled down. And he had family with my mom. I have an older brother, his name is Michael. He's 18 months older than me, which my mom and my dad were overjoyed about because they always wanted a boy first. And then when I was born, I was backwards, it was breech. And so my mom and my dad actually did not know my gender until I was actually born. And they always wanted me to be a girl though. That was always something that they had dreamed of is having an older boy and a younger girl. And so when I was born, my mom always says when they cut me out via C-section and they said, it's a girl. My mom and dad were just like over the moon. And so they were just like so happy and that completed their family. So they didn't have any more kids. It's just my brother and I. And we were born in Southern California, both of us. I was born in Lancaster. And we lived there until I was five. And then my dad actually wound up becoming a self-certified Microsoft engineer. That was like not normal for Microsoft engineers to be self-taught and to get certified. Like that was really difficult back then. Um, my dad was really smart. So we got certified and when he did, we moved up to Northern California when I was five because there was just more jobs up here for him with the tech boom happening in the Silicon Valley and stuff like that. He was just able to find more opportunities for work up here. I have been here in the Bay Area ever since. I've never left. I have no intentions of leaving. I love it here. Here. We lived honestly in like this perfect little American family for a while until I was seven That's when things really changed, but everything was really nice. My mom was a stay-at-home mom She always wanted that and so that was like her living out her dream She ran like a little daycare She would watch after her friends kids and my brother and I loved it because we got to hang out with our friends every day And it was great for her because she got paid to stay home with us And that was what she always wanted and my dad would get different contracted jobs where he would build computer servers, which were like the sizes of rooms back then, which he would be just flabbergasted at technology now, but they were huge. <laughs> so he would get contracted to build them for banks, for like, I mean, you name it, anything that needed a computer, he was there building it. And we really had like a really, really, really normal good life for a while. When I was seven, my dad and my brother, my mom and my grandma and I, we went to the park to shoot off this model rocket. My dad and my brother were like really into building model things. So they built this model rocket and my brother really, really wanted to go shoot it off at the park. And so we did one day. My dad hopped over the fence to get it because it had flown over a fence. And so he hopped over, he got it. And when he came back over, when he landed, his knee just like completely shattered. He had had a former broken knee carrying a speaker like back when he was a music musician, like way before my brother and I were born. And so because it was so weak, it just shattered when he landed on it into like 13 different pieces or something crazy like that. I remember being like fully panicked that day. Like I thought he was dying because I was seven and I didn't know what was going on when the ambulance came in. I just knew ambulances were not good things. Um, but they took him to the hospital and they operated to fix it. They had to put like a bajillion screws and plates and rods. Like he was based, his knee was basically made of metal but from that point forward. We've been told since then that the way that they did the surgery was not the wrong way to do it, but it wasn't the best way. And so he had a lot of problems with it. It just wasn't right. He couldn't move forward with physical therapy and like bear weight on it and he wasn't able to work for a really long time because of that and as a result they kept going back in to do more and more surgeries i want to say over the course of the next like eight years he probably had a surgery a year so it's probably eight different surgeries along the way he had bone infections skin infections like you name it he had it we used to call his knee franken knee and that sounds so mean but like Really the only mechanism of coping that my family had growing up was laughing <laughs> because you know, there was just nothing else we could do. We either laugh or you cry. Um, and so we used to call his knee Frankenknee because it really truthfully was 
uh, a disaster. Uh, he had multiple skin grafts because he had had abscesses that had formed from infection on his knee. He had bone infections and it was huge. When I tell you his knee was the size of a watermelon, like it really was because of the amount of scar tissue and metal wear that they had had to put into his knee just to hold it together. And even then he walked with a cane. He really like wasn't able to work really ever again for a short period of time later, a couple years later he could, but for the most part, he didn't have a job after that point because he just couldn't. And he was in so much pain all the time. And he tried everything. He tried nerve blocks. He tried like hot baths. Like I remember that man took multiple baths a day for like years because it was just like the only thing that would relieve some of the pain that he had. And to be honest, if you looked at his knee, you'd be like, oh my God, how are you surviving like this? It looked excruciating. And after a couple years, it was the early 2000s by this point. And something that you do need to know is that my dad was an alcoholic before I was born. He quit, went cold turkey when my mom and him decided to have a family. And I never saw that man pick up a drink after that. But he did have a history with addiction. And in the early 2000s, Oxycontin came on the market. They've done a lot of like really good television shows as of late that depict it to a T, like exactly what my family went through. And Oxycontin, as it was advertised in the beginning, was a miracle. It was non-addictive, they said, and it would allow him to like live his life again. And to us, that sounded great. We were like, cool, sign us up. And so he started taking Oxycontin and it really was magical in the beginning. Like I genuinely remember all of a sudden I had my dad back. And I was like so excited because I thought like, oh my God, I have like a normal parent again. Like this is so cool. And our family can go back to being the way that it was. That was a naive thought because that is not what happened. Um, if you don't know anything about the Oxycontin epidemic, essentially the drug was marketed as non-addictive when it was actually more addictive than morphine and a lot of the other narcotics that were on the market at the time. But patients didn't know. So my dad was prescribed it, which is unfortunate for somebody with a history of addiction because he was just like the worst target. So he started taking it and it was great. And then a couple years went by and his tolerance started to grow and he needed more and more and more and more. And by the time I was 12, according to his doctors, they literally said this word for word, he was on enough Oxycontin to tranquilize an elephant. Like it was $4,000 a month worth of Oxycontin because the doctors just kept prescribing more and more and more and more until they would just stop prescribing for him. And he was just stuck. Like he had all of this pain and he was, but he was taking all this Oxycontin, but it wasn't doing anything because he had built such a tolerance over time. And then at a certain point, all of the pain clinics wouldn't prescribe him anymore. And so he was just stuck and it was miserable to watch him go through that. My mom and my dad at that point fought constantly. Uh, my dad became a very active hoarder. I don't really talk about this a lot. I actually don't think I've ever talked about this on Instagram or TikTok, but my dad was a significant hoarder. And it just got worse and worse as his addiction got worse. He just would bring home all kinds of stuff, like stuff we did not need. And we didn't have the money to pay for because he wasn't working and he was on disability. And my mom tried so hard. I mean, she worked so hard to try to keep our house livable and normal for two kids. But slowly but surely, my brother and I started to just notice them fighting more and that our home really wasn't a normal place to live. My dad constantly fell asleep in his food. He was, he was high all the time. Um, I mean, I didn't know that that's what that was back then, but he was just like not present for many, many years. I really did not want my parents to separate. I was really traumatized by the thought of that when I was a kid, when I was really young. My brother would bring it up to me and I'd be like, no, 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 like mom and dad aren't gonna get divorced. That's not gonna happen. But by the time I was 12, I was just so tired of listening to them fight. And I was so tired of watching my dad fall asleep in his food constantly. Like he was never awake and alert ever. He was just constantly like, he was constantly high. And that became something that I couldn't deal with anymore by the time I was 12, it was too much. And so my mom, God bless her. I have absolutely no idea now that I'm an adult how she did this because it had to have been so incredibly difficult, but she took my brother and I and she moved us into an apartment. She got a job working for 24 Hour Fitness in their corporate offices. And uh, so she adopted a full-time job after not having one for a really long time. She went back to school. She wound up getting her master's degree in educational psychology, 
but she just saw things not going well with my dad and she knew that she needed to find a way to provide for us. And so she went back to school, she got a full-time job and she moved us into an apartment so that my brother and I could have like a normal life. And as much as it crushed me, like I, I will always remember standing in my closet in my childhood home, packing up a box of my clothes to move into a, a different place away from my dad. And I always thought it would be temporary it wound up not being that way, but I just will always remember thinking like how bizarre it was that I was packing up all my things to move away from him. Like that just seemed so unimaginable. But by the time we got into the apartment, my brother and I were so grateful. Like I'm just so, I'm so grateful always for my mom because we just, we wouldn't have had the lives that we did without her. And that would have really damaged us more than it, it already had if she hadn't taken us out of that really unhealthy setting. And I just remember being in the apartment and we actually had really, really good times in the apartment. Like it was the first time Michael and I had like a normal life and that was really cool. I mean, it wasn't normal. I'm not gonna say that it was. My mom was working full time and my brother and I had to lean on each other. And my dad fell further and further into his addiction and further and further into his hoarding, into the point where like my childhood home was like covered in maggots from old food. And it was, my mom wouldn't let us go over there at a certain point because there was nowhere to sit um, because there were so many things and it wasn't clean. It was not sanitary, even like a little bit. Um, and so my mom, we, we, we didn't go over there. And by the time I was 15, Pretty much every time I talked to my dad on the phone, we would fight. And for hours, we would just be screaming at each other on the phone because if you know anything about addicts, they just don't understand why you don't accept them the way that they are because they don't see it. And so he just didn't understand like why I didn't love him. And I did love him. It wasn't that, I just, he wasn't my dad anymore. And he didn't, he couldn't see that. And I, he just like was like, why don't you want to come over and spend time with me? And, and I just remember like telling him like, because you're not normal, because you're not my dad. Like, and that would really hurt his feelings and we would just do nothing but fight. By the spring of my freshman year of high school, my dad probably weighed a hundred pounds and he lived in a house. He had like moved like maybe 45 minutes away, um, still deep in his addiction. He got new medical insurance and they said they were going to pay for all of his Oxycontin. And my mom was like, no, they're not going to pay for that. Like that's, it doesn't work like that. They did for a month and then they just cut him off all of a sudden. And I, at the time, was at a Winter Guard competition. I did Winter Guard and Color Guard, if you know what any of those things are. It's, Winter Guard's kind of like a dance team slash Color Guard with like the rifles and the flags and stuff. I loved it because I grew up dancing. I did like ballet, tap, jazz, Irish, you name it, I did it. Like my mom, I don't even know how she managed to make all of those things happen while we were living through what we did but I had winter guard and color guard and band and like all of these things that I, I got to do outside of school. And by the spring of my freshman year of high school, we went to world championships for my winter guard team in Ohio, which is really cool, WGI, uh, if any of you know what that is. Um, it was really, really exciting. And I remember calling my dad while I was there and we talked and it was the first good conversation we had had in a really, really long time. And he was just telling me like how proud he was of me and how much he loved me and how excited he was to hear about my experiences that I was gonna have on this trip. And then I lost contact with him. I didn't know at the time, uh, but that was because he had passed away from massive withdrawal, not an overdose like you would probably assume from an addict. And I came home and my brother was the one that broke the news to me because my sweet mom, like she just couldn't even say it out loud. And I remember when he told me, I, I expected it because I had really like grieved the loss of him for eight years at that point. And I knew that he didn't look good. And my mom had kind of started to prepare us for the fact that like things might not, not turn out well for him. When my brother told me, I remember not even crying because I, I like knew it was gonna happen. And that's so bizarre. Um, it was a lot for a 15 year old <laughs> to take on to say the least. Um, and then we just kind of move forward after that. That experience really broke me and built me into the person I am today. I miss my dad tremendously. Uh, I really wish that he was still here, but like it was what it was. And thank God for my mom. Uh, she became a very sturdy rock for us, even though that was really difficult for her. My mom and my brother wound up struggling with their own addictions as time went on, but my mom had met my stepdad 
Long story short, he was my uh, instructor in my drum line and my mom and him met. And like I said, very long story short, we go into that another time, but they started dating and we moved in with him and my relationship with him was really rocky. And it, it just, we just did not see eye to eye. He's Chinese and that is relative because he almost like, I always say like perfect Asian daughtered me, which he did. Um, he saw potential in me and in his eyes, that meant that he could never let me know that I was doing well because he needed to push me. And that's a compliment in Asian cultures. But when you're raised by my mom, who's nothing but sunshine and rainbows and like tells you how wonderful you are, even when you don't, don't do anything that cool. Um, <laughs> it was really hurtful to me that he didn't tell me that he was proud of me ever. So he and I had a really, really bad relationship, even though we all lived in the same home and it was pretty wild uh, all throughout my, the rest of my high school days. And my brother and I leaned on each other a lot. We became really, really close because we were the only people that knew what the other person had gone through. And so we just spent a lot of time together. All of my brother's friends were my friends. I dated a couple of my brother's friends. Whoops. What younger sister hasn't tried to date some of her older brother's friends? None of them worked out, obviously, because by the time I was 18, I met my now husband, Kyle. We met at a movie theater that I started working at because it was walking distance from the house I lived in with my mom and my stepdad. And we actually didn't meet for several years. Like I started working at that movie theater when I was 16 and Kyle and I didn't meet each other until I turned 18. I have absolutely no idea how we didn't know each other existed in that building because everybody knew everybody. Like I'm still confused to how we got, we literally got employee of the month together twice and we had no idea who the other person was. <laughs> so needless to say, it was kind of bizarre, maybe serendipitous that he like fell into my life at the right time. I met him on a night that I actually went to an employee ice skating party, not knowing that I was actually scheduled to work because I was in high school and they didn't normally schedule us on weekdays, but I had just turned 18 so they could. And so I'm literally at the company ice skating party and they're like, you're supposed to be at work. What are you doing? So I go to work. I'm flustered because I'm never late anywhere. And I just like, I'd, I'd never been written up. Like I was freaking out. And Kyle actually stayed that night to teach me how to clean the popcorn popper, even though he wanted to come and play video games, <laughs> but he stayed to, to teach me how to clean the popcorn popper. And I remember thinking he was too old for me. So I really like wasn't interested in him that first night. But then the next shift that we worked together, closing in the box office, we started talking and I remember thinking like, oh, he's kind of cute. And then I like learned how old he was and I was like, oh, he's only three years older than me. Like, okay, he's like attainable. And then we started exchanging phone numbers and, and we just like became really, really fast friends. And I really liked him and I was pretty sure he really liked me, but he had a girlfriend. That's a very long story. He wound up breaking up with that girlfriend several months after he and I met and were like friends. Um, and to be honest, I think that was so good for our relationship because we were really friends first. And then we started dating and truthfully, the rest is history with Kyle. Like I knew from the moment I met him, like I've never been more certain about anything in my whole life. I was just like, this is the person I'm supposed to be with. Like I love him and I can't possibly imagine loving anybody else the way that I love him. And at 18, that was kind of crazy, <laughs> but I just knew it. Like, I, I mean, when they say when you know, you know, like I knew. And I was just like, so excited to spend every single second with him. And by the time I was 20, things at home for me were really, really bad with my stepdad. He was really not kind to me at that point. And so Kyle and I, despite the fact that we probably did not have enough money really to do it, like we did, but just barely, we moved in together <laughs> into a 500 square foot apartment. It was our Cracker Jack box. Um, we were super grateful to have it. I s started working for a bank. I started working for JP Morgan Chase Bank. Hey, yo, um, I didn't love that job. I liked the people in the job, hated money, hated working with money. And Kyle was a manager at the movie theater that we met at and we barely made ends meet, but we were just so happy to have our own little space. And that built us really, really well for the rest of our relationship. Like not really having a lot of money and not having really a lot of like things <laughs> um, made us so much more grateful as we got older and grew together in our careers and started making more money. Like it was just like, we were just so much more grateful for it. My relationship with my stepdad wound up mending over, I forgave him really without apology for a lot of things that I probably shouldn't have forgiven him for, but I just couldn't hold on to it anymore. And so I said, cool, I'm just gonna forgive you because I just, I can't, I can't hold on to this kind of angst anymore because it's really dragging me down. <laughs> so 
I forgave him and we started talking and he has really shown me with his actions as I've gotten older that he's sorry, even though he's never really directly said it. But once again, that's like not really customary in the Asian male culture. He's very stubborn and so he's never really formally apologized to me, but I've always just like accepted that. But our relationship is so much better now and I'm really grateful for that. And he's really spent time trying to show me like how much he loves me and how proud he is. He has told me he's proud of me. Um, he was like so excited when I got into nursing school. That brings us to that part of my life. I went to community college first right out of high school, even though my high school teachers thought that was not a good thing for me to do because I was too smart to go to community college, which is such BS if you ask me. I wanted to save money and I knew the nursing school was gonna be expensive. So I was like, I'm gonna go to community college and live at home and be smart financially. And I'm always really glad that I did that. Um, I'm always really glad that nobody peer pressured me into going to a four year college because I didn't wanna go to one. And so I went to community college. I did all my prereqs there. And then I transferred into nursing school by my mid twenties. And so I did nursing school when I was living together with Kyle, which was wild because I literally studied about two feet from him playing Call of Duty. <laughs> I could block out the world in that apartment. I was like really good and I did really well in nursing school. I loved it. I've wanted to be a nurse since I was a kid, since my dad was in the hospital. That was like, to be honest, I don't think that I would have wanted to be a nurse without my dad being in the hospital as much as he was because the nurses genuinely like they made his visits in the hospital tolerable. Like they would make tables and stuff for us to do our homework on and they made like movie nights for us and just like they built memories for my family that like we would not have had without them and I'm so grateful for that and I always thought like I want to do that for somebody else someday so I really like from the age of eight on I only wanted to be a nurse so I beelined for it out of high school and by the time I got into nursing school I was just like so excited to be there I was like this is so cool that like all of my dreams are coming true I wanted to be a geriatric nurse which is where you take care of elderly people because I was a caregiver for a really long time and I liked that a lot but I learned through nursing school that I just want to be their friend. I didn't want to be their nurse. So I did have like a bit of a crisis when I hit my last semester of nursing school, thinking like, oh my God, I have no idea what I want to do now. And I did my pediatric rotation and my peds clinical instructor, Karen, Karen is the whole reason that I changed career paths. And she was like, listen, you love kids. Like, why don't you want to be a pediatric nurse? And I was like, no, 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 I simply could not. They're too scary, absolutely not. She was like, no, I just like, I really think that like you would be good at this. Like you're so good with the kids. And I just like, I fought it for a while. And then by the end of my pediatric rotation, I was like, I'm going peds. I'm just gonna bite the bullet and do my preceptorship in pediatrics. And if it works out, great. And if it doesn't, it's just my preceptorship. I can always like make a pivot after nursing school. So I wound up precepting in pediatric cardiac ICU. I actually did not choose that. I asked for peds med surge and they put me in peds cardiac ICU because I, in my nursing program, I did excel academically. I was in Sigma Theta Tau, which means that I was in the top like 18% of my class. So like I, I, I did excel academically in my nursing school. And in your ICU rotation in my nursing school, how it would work is if you came out of that class with a certain score and your clinical instructors recommended you, then you could precept in the ICU. You could, keyword if you asked for it, but I didn't ask for it because I didn't want it. But because they believed in me so much, apparently my ICU clinical instructors, they said, you have to put her in the ICU. So they, so they did, they put me in Pete's cardiac ICU, which if you don't know anything about the world of nursing or pediatric nursing, that's one of the wildest places you could ever start as a, as like a new nurse. But I went there for my preceptorship and it was terrifying. I won't lie to you. Um, absolutely terrifying. I could do like another video about like my, career as a nurse, um, but it was really, really wild. And then somehow I fell in love with it. And that's where my first job was. I wound up being in their new grad program and I worked there for about four years while my husband uh, became an EMT. We got engaged in 2017, in August of 2017 in Monterey. It was beautiful. Um, still one of the best days of my life. After eight years of dating, <laughs> which people are like, what took you so long? And we were like, listen, we were, we were becoming adults and like, it took us a really long time, honestly, to get to the point where we could even afford to have to do a wedding. And a year later, we got married in 2018, in September of 2018, best day of my life, because I got to marry the person I knew pretty much for most of my life I wanted to marry. Um, so it was super exciting. Right after we got married, I developed tremors. That's another story all in itself, so I could do another video on that, but uh, I developed tremors and that was a stress response actually that triggered a condition that I have. And 
my job in PCVICU just had outrun me. I just couldn't, I couldn't do it anymore. I was working night shift. I was commuting a really, really long way, an hour and 15 minutes one way to get to work. And that just like became not doable for me anymore. And Kyle was working 12 hour day shift in EMS. So I never saw him. And so that was really, really hard. Like, especially right after we got married and we were supposed to be in like our sweet newlywed phase. And I was like, I never see you for most of the week. I burnt out really hard of that job. I developed tremors, like I said, and I wound up leaving because my body just like couldn't do it anymore. And I went to work in general pediatric ICU and I've been there for the last like five years. And Kyle, in the process of all of that, he applied to nursing school, got accepted into it. And he's now in his last semester of nursing school. He is currently at school right now in skills lab. And he is finishing out his last semester of nursing school, which is crazy. He, for a long time, wasn't sure if he wanted to be a paramedic or a nurse, but he wound up choosing nursing. And I'm really glad because I think he's gonna have so many more opportunities as a nurse. A lot of you guys always ask like where he wants to be. I don't really know if he even knows where he wants to be just yet. Uh, I think he's, he's figuring that out um, as he goes. Obviously the ER is a very easy guess, which he's not opposed to. I think he's kind of just gonna see like what opportunities come his way when he graduates and gets his license and starts applying. And I have been on disability for the last year from my job, as a lot of you guys know, because I hurt my shoulder, uh, which by the way is very angry at me today because I pushed it a little too hard, I think in physical therapy. I'm trying to advance and she doesn't want to advance and I just don't know what's wrong with her. Last year I developed like excruciating shoulder pain over the course of like three months. And it got to the point that I like was losing feeling in my hand and like it was so painful I like couldn't even lift my arm up anymore. And so I wound up having to leave my job because I couldn't lift the patients anymore. I couldn't like move, lift pumps. Like being a bedside nurse is such a physical job, especially in the ICU. And I just like couldn't, I literally couldn't do it anymore. It was way too painful. And I have been in the process of like getting diagnosed and all that kind of stuff. A lot of you guys who follow me on Instagram and TikTok, you guys know that part of my story. And so I have been uh, mostly in insurance hell for the last year. My hospital dropped my health insurance after five months. And by that point I had like barely gotten like a good doctor with good testing to like move me towards surgery. And then they dropped my insurance. Then I got state health insurance and I have been fighting that battle for the last like four or five months now. And I'm finally back seeing an orthopedist. So I'm back to square one. I basically had to start back over, but I did have all my testing and stuff that they had done last year. Um, so that's great. So I'm just waiting on nerve testing right now because they need to go in and do surgery because at this point I've exhausted all of the other options. They really try not to do surgery on shoulders is what I have learned in the process because I guess they don't heal very well. And so they really try not to because like when I tore my ACL, in my knee in high school, they were like, cool, we're going in, we're gonna fix it, we'll come right back out, no big deal. Like they never even questioned surgery. But with shoulders, I guess they just like really, really don't like to do surgery on them. Um, so they try everything else first before they will consider surgery. And that's where I'm at right now. So I've got a good team now, which is great. So I'm working through that. And somehow I started social media in the midst of all of that back in like 2020. And that was actually where I started on YouTube. I did not start on TikTok, like I think a lot of people assume because it's my biggest platform. I started on YouTube back in probably December of 2019. I did Vlogmas. And I was just like, I loved watching YouTubers. And I had kind of always thought I wanted to do it myself. And so Kyle was like, why don't you just do it? Like just, just do Vlogmas or something. And so I did. I, they always say make the kind of content that you like to watch. So that's what I did and I loved watching Vlogmas, so I did Vlogmas and it was really exciting to learn how to edit and all of that. And then that gave way into TikTok for me in January of 2020 and then my social media ball just started rolling and it kind of like just fell into place. Like I never really had intentions of like intentionally doing social media, um, but after a while it just became so fun to make content for you guys that I just like, I fell right in and, and now I still do it. I love it. I really actually like love making content in ways that I never thought that I would. It's been super fun. And it's really exciting to be back on YouTube now that I have the technology. I just got a MacBook, a lot of you guys know that, to like be able to technologically move the footage from my phone to my computer. That was something I could not do on my like 15 year old Dell that I have. <laughs> so I just got new technology. So now I can post videos for you guys. And that's like so fun. Like I missed being here. I missed long form content because it is so hard to shove everything into like three minutes. It's so hard to do that. It's way harder than it looks. 
you have to cut everything out. And I feel like a lot of the time that makes me so sad. And so I'm just like excited to be here. I'm excited to be here with you guys. That was 32 years of my life. Just rolled up into one video. I feel like it was mostly the Cliff Notes version. At least I tried. This is kind of a long video. So like if you're still here, hi. Thank you for being here. Did you get a snack at some point? You probably got a little hungry along the way. It was a long journey. 32 whole years. And here I am sitting talking to you on the YouTubes. And I'm happy to be here. And I'm happy that you're here. And I hope that you guys continue to like hang out with me here for longer videos. And if you ever wanna see anything that I haven't shown you, please ask. Or if you wanna hear more about anything I talked about today, I'm an open book. I like, there's not really any parts of my life that I'm ashamed to share because they all have made me who I am today. And I'm really proud of the person that I am today. Be sure to give us a thumbs up if you liked it. Be sure to subscribe so you never have to miss me. And I will see you in the next video. I love you, goodbye.